Right, well, we're all familiar with those words, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Uh, very clear words from the Lord Jesus before his ascension to heaven, to his disciples. Um, and really, I just want to a ask the question, did they do what he said? Did they go into all the world and preach the gospel? If they did, what was that gospel? Did men believe? Were they baptized? That's what Jesus told them to do. That was quite a commission he gave them, really, when you think about it. I mean, these were 11 men, in fact, soon to be 12 again. But nevertheless, just a few men, some of them completely uneducated. And yet they turned the world upside down in a relatively short period of time. Of course, they did that partly, well, to a great extent, because of the power that Jesus and God gave to them in the form of the Holy Spirit gifts, of which we read about the, um, some of those miracles they were able to do there in that 16th chapter of Mark. Um, and, of course, if it hadn't have been for those miracles, and particularly the uh, ability to speak in other languages... I don't think they would have turned the world upside down, even though there were men who were courageous and had their own testimony. Nevertheless, it needed something more than that. We don't particularly want to think too much about the Holy Spirit gifts this afternoon, but what I do want to do, which might, I thought, be interesting for you, is to actually have a look at what they did in the terms of what they preached now, of course, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach to every creature. Well, of course, it was quite a time before that actually happened. And in fact, the, the apostles, the, 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 the 12 at any rate, the 12 disciples, didn't really do that, I think, as they should have done. Uh, and the message was very much limited to the Jews for quite a while. It took the conversion of Cornelius engineered very much by Jesus himself uh, and after that even after that okay they preached to the Samaritans but it didn't go much further afield until the apostle Paul came along and for various reasons he was a perfect choice although we wouldn't have chosen him um, to take the word to the Gentile but this afternoon I want to look at, at the word as it went to the Jew. The Jews were the first to hear the gospel message. They were the people of God. They were the people who for centuries had been prepared for this very time when their Messiah would come. Sadly, that had all gone wrong and they had misunderstood him, rejected him, hated him. He wasn't the one they wanted. They crucified him and put him to death. But of course, that was all part of of the plan of God anyway and God didn't cast them away and he still hasn't cast them away and it was to the Jew first that Paul went and it's to the Jew first in the Acts of the Apostles that the Apostles preached to now to speak to the Jews about the crucified and resurrected Messiah was a challenge um, it was both a, a good thing there were good things about preaching to the Jews about that but there were also bad things. Um, just to keep you awake, I'll ask you a question. What was the good thing about preaching to the Jew? How, how, in what way did it make it easy for the apostles in some way? Anybody? They what? They knew the scriptures, exactly. So he didn't have to start with teaching them about the God of heaven who created heaven and earth. Interestingly, that's what Paul does in Acts 17 when he preaches to the Gentiles in Athens he has to start from the bottom just as we're having to do today but but Peter didn't need to do that and the apostles on the day of Pentecost didn't need to do that these people already knew their Old Testament they knew about the promises to Abraham and David and the kingdom of God and the glory of Israel and the coming Messiah so that was the good bit what was the bad bit what was the hard thing when it came to the apostles having to preach to the Jews about this man mm -hmm. no it was a hard thing I might have to give you a clue 
Who said it would be a stumbling block to the Jew? What was it that was the stumbling block? Christ crucified, exactly. That the Messiah should be a crucified man, put to death, shamed, on a cross, crucifixion, and raised again. This was something the Jew never expected. I doubt whether there were many even in the Old Testament that did expect that, perhaps one or two, and that's my opinion. Um, but certainly this was a great stumbling block for the Jew. And on top of that, there is another thing. The other thing, of course, was that the Messiah should be the Son of God. That was way out of anything they, they expected. Okay, you could say, well, they should have expected it, perhaps, uh, but they didn't. So there was easy things and hard things. Let's go and have a look at it, shall we, in Acts chapter 2. And let's see what Peter actually said to the Jews when they started to preach. We won't go into the preamble of chapter 2, which is really about the impact of the speaking in tongues, which the, the people were amazed at. Who wouldn't be amazed at it? There were people there, Jews from all over the Jewish world, speaking all sorts of different languages, and, and the apostles were able to speak to them in their own language. So that was an amazing thing. To, to begin with, you remember some of the people said, well, they're drunk. I suppose it would have sounded like they were drunk, speaking different languages and just being normal Jews from Judea and Jerusalem. Uh, but then there was explained to them that this, they weren't drunk. It's the third hour of the day, that's verse 15. And in fact, this was the fulfillment of prophecy. God had prophesied that he would pour out his spirit in these days to assist and to empower, if you like, the message of the apostles. But what was that message? Well, Peter starts his speech in, chapter, in verse 22 of Acts chapter 2. And uh, I can remember having to learn this verse as a proof in Sunday school, um, which shows that he did some good, I suppose. Um, and we're going to look at this. It goes down to, well, his speech goes down pretty much to the end of, no, it doesn't. It goes down to uh, verse 39. Now, I bet you could read verses, uh, what have I just said, 22 to 39 in what, five minutes? Perhaps, perhaps even less if you're a quick reader. I doubt whether he spoke for five minutes. Um, I've never spoken for five minutes in my life from a platform. <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine it probably went on for a couple of hours at least. Um, so that's, I only say that to emphasize that what we have here is a massive summary, a massive condensing down into the absolute... Um, fundamentals of what he actually said he would have explained far more perhaps like I'm going to try and explain some of it now um, he would have done the same so that's worth bearing in mind so let's, let's get straight in shall we in verse 22 ye men of Israel he says hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth so there would be no possibility of mistaking who he was talking about this is the man from Nazareth the one who was despised from the despised place yes the carpenter's son that very same person and notice it calls him a man that's very important the man he's not a god it wasn't divine it wasn't an angel or a spirit or any, any other sort of being he was a man and in fact, he calls him a man because he's still a man. And that's important too. He's got a different body to you and me, yes, but he's still a man. He's not a God now. Even though he is to be worshipped along with God, he's a man. And that's, that's sort of fundamental really and easily missed, I suggest. He's a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know that's interesting he's saying you know about these things the ministry of Jesus was very public very public and everybody knew about him and many of them would, the people he's talking to would have been witnesses of his miracles which were of course a testimony 
to the fact that he was who he said he was. They, they gave power, if you like, to his words, just in the same way that the Holy Spirit gifts were now giving power and uh, would be um, authority to the words of the apostles. But notice he says, very careful about the words, he says, which God did by him. Now that's interesting again. He didn't say the miracles which Jesus did. Now, of course, to the casual observer, Jesus did the miracles. Jesus said, rise up and walk. Jesus put his hands on their eyes and they could see, or, ear, or fingers in their ears and they could hear. Jesus did it, but here we're being specifically told God did them through him. Now, I'm only emphasizing that and the business of him being a man, because this, this instantly um, is useful to us, isn't it? There's no Trinitarian hint at all here, is there? Jesus is Jesus, God is God. Jesus does things because God's working through him. And there's no blurring here of the, uh, of the demarcation. So that, that's important. As we go through, I just want to perhaps in your mind just tick off Christadelphian teachings. It's quite useful. It's interesting. You'd be surprised perhaps as to how many there are here. Um, in this short section of Peter's preaching. Verse 23, he says, Him, this man, this very same man, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Now, they all knew that he'd been crucified, and they knew that the Jewish leaders had delivered him up to Pilate. He'd been put to, to death, really, by the Jews, not the Romans. The Romans did as they, well, Pilate had his arm up his back, didn't he, by the time he actually said, do it. So really, they were just pawns in this game. It was the Jews who delivered him up. But it says here that this was God's determinate counsel. In other words, this was... This was God's purpose, put in it in a simple way. God had determined before that this is what should happen. And that was a very important thing which the Jew would never have realised before, that this was all part of the plan of God, that his son should be delivered up, should give his life, should be a sacrifice for sin. Very hard for the Jew to accept that. But they did, or at least those who listened did, uh, did, uh, and foreknowledge of God all known to God beforehand of course but notice he adds then ye verse 23 have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain so just because it was in the purpose of God didn't mean that they were okay to do it these were wicked men who did the worst perpetrated what we could call the worst crime that man had ever committed to put this perfect man, this lovely man, to death in such a way, the, the very son of God, the, the very man who'd come to save them from death, and they killed him. Um, this emphasised more in the next chapter, actually, than it is here. So they were wicked men to do it. So he's explaining to them this was all part of the purpose of God, even that he should be crucified. Verse 24, whom God hath raised up. Notice God's raised him up. Couldn't raise himself up. No trinity here. God had to raise him up from the dead. And he, know, and he, he adds there, of course, as they do in this first section of Acts. He says, um, where is it? Uh, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Sorry, I was looking for the bit where it said of which we are all witnesses, but that comes later, doesn't it? We'll come to that later. But notice he says, God has loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, he doesn't actually explain what he means there. Whether he did when, you know, maybe that's a bit that we don't have. He said it wasn't possible that the grave could hold him. Perhaps the Jew would understand what he meant there. We know what he meant. It wasn't possible that he should stay in the grave because the man was sinless. He'd never done anything worthy of, of the grave. He'd never done anything worthy of death. The only man who'd ever lived who'd never been, um, who'd never deserved death, you know, 
the wages of sin is death. That didn't apply to him. So he, God couldn't leave him in the grave. Seems an odd thing to say that God can't do something, but it would have been a denial of himself. It would have been a, an unrighteous and an unjust thing to leave him in the grave. Therefore, God uh, loosed those, the pains of death. So there's another teaching there that Jesus was the sinless one. The man who didn't deserve death. It comes later again. And then verse 25, he says, David speaks concerning him. And the section there from verse 25 down to, um, uh, down to 28 is actually a quotation. Maybe you'd like to keep your finger in Acts 2. This will help keep you awake. And come to Psalm 16. And let's read it from the psalm. Now, it was very important that the apostles should use the Old Testament in their preaching to the Jews. Because it showed the Jews that the teaching of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, and the gospel, the good news um, of salvation in Christ, was based in the, in the Old Testament. So it's Psalm 16. And if we start reading at verse 8... This is um, David speaking. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Well, David could well have said that, couldn't he? There's a sort of sentiments you'd expect of David. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the paths of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, although David wrote that, Peter is saying here in Acts chapter 2, they're not actually the words of David. They're the words of Messiah written in prophecy. And this happens quite a lot in the prophets and in the Psalms, where the words of Messiah himself are there in David's Psalms by inspiration. In fact, that's what he says. Look, if you come back to Acts 2 and verse 30, it says he was a prophet. David was a prophet, spoke by inspiration. So these words here are the words of Messiah, or at least the sentiments of Messiah. And here in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter is showing quite clearly that David believed in the Holy One of God, that is Messiah, and that he would not suffer corruption. In other words, he wouldn't be left in the grave. He would rise from the dead. D David here, he's saying, is speaking of the resurrection of Christ. And that's what it says if you come down a little bit further. Uh, verse 30, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So David knew about the promises to David that Christ would sit on his throne. Verse 31, seeing this beforehand, he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. So there's one man in the Old Testament at least, who may well have understood these words, that Messiah was going to die, but would not see corruption and would be raised from the dead and given David's throne. And it's very important that Peter establishes to the Jews that this is what David said. This is a fulfillment. The crucifixion and the resurrection are a fulfilment of what David said in the Psalms. But look at the words that are used here. We'll, we'll stick in Acts chapter 2 now. So as you're going backwards and forwards. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Why? Why is he talking about souls in hell? That's interesting, isn't it? How come the soul of Messiah, of Jesus, went to hell? In traditional church teaching in this country, souls go to heaven if you're good and they go to hell if you're bad. But Jesus' soul is, is in hell, at least for three days. What a wonderful, you know, a wonderful explanation this is of what the soul is and what hell is. Soul is just the person. He went to hell, literally. So hell isn't a place where 
under the ground where men are tormented forever if they've been bad boys. This is simply the grave. That's where Jesus was for three days. But his soul wasn't left there. So again, another useful teaching for us about hell and the grave and the soul for that matter. But we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Neither shalt thou suffer, verse 27, thy holy one. Now that's interesting. Why does he call him the holy one? It's not a phrase you come up that often in scripture. Jesus is called the holy one. It's a, you get it again in chapter 3 also. It talks about the holy one, the holy one of God. He's the holy one because he's a special man. He's the son of God. Remember Luke chapter 1 when God said to Mary, therefore that holy child which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God he was the only one that could be called that in that sense I know all the saints are supposed to be holy ones in a sense but by birth Jesus was the holy one and he's called that here a special man not just any man again we'll come back to that where have we got down to uh, yes, verse 28. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now the Jew could have said, well, David is speaking about himself. He's speaking about himself when he says that his soul would not be left in, in hell and wouldn't see corruption, that God would show him the ways of life. Well, David did believe in resurrection, of course. But Peter makes the point that he's not speaking about himself. He's speaking about Messiah, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. He's dead. You can go and look at his sepulchre if you like. He's still dead. This isn't David that's being spoken about. Um, actually, implicit in the words of the psalm are that Jesus not only rises from the dead, but goes to the Father. That's why he says later, David is not ascended into the heavens. But that's, that's a, an aside, really. Anyway, he says, verse 29, look, David's dead and buried. It's not him. Verse 30, David was a prophet. He's speaking about Christ. Verse 31, the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses um, and of course that was a big thing wasn't it they themselves were witnesses of the resurrection in fact the whole thing's about the resurrection really the resurrection was the big explosion wasn't it this is the big thing this is the great fact of history on which the whole of the gospel of Christ rests that God raised his son back to life never to die again because he was a perfect man he was the perfect lamb the sacrifice for sins and that's a big thing isn't it which in all of the speeches in Acts they all witness to the resurrection in other words he's saying Jesus isn't dead he's alive we've seen him we've eaten with him We've spoken with him for six weeks. And even after that, Jesus appeared to many. What is it Paul says? Over 500 on one occasion. And he says many of them are still alive. You can go and speak to them. And they'll testify. This is the big thing. Jesus is not dead. He is alive. He is the saviour. And he is in heaven with the Father. At least for the moment. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he hath shed forth this which you now see and hear. There's another basic teaching. Jesus is at the right hand, exalted, the right hand of God. But he's not there forever. We'll come to it in a minute. Look at verse 34. David is not ascended into the heavens. Now, I wonder why he said that. Why should he say that to the Jew? Did the Jews believe that David was in heaven? Well, I suggest that some of them did, actually, yeah. The doctrine of going to heaven was already here. It was part of 
the mythology and superstitions which many of the Jews had taken on board right from the time of the Babylonian captivity and it was still going on remember when Jesus spoke about Abraham uh, the, the, in, in, the, in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus Abraham's bosom was deemed to be in heaven with God because that was part of the, of the teaching of some of the Jews they actually did believe that some of the patriarchs went to heaven and, and Peter is saying quite categorically here David is not ascended into the heavens that's good again for us isn't it shows that people don't go to heaven when they die the only man who's gone to heaven whose soul is now in heaven if you like is Jesus himself he's the only man and he's coming back so even David's not there we don't go to heaven when we die but what God did say in the end of verse 34 and again this is another quotation from the Psalms and I think yes this is Psalm 110 he said the Lord said to my Lord sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool so there he's going back to David again so look what David said about Messiah he said that he would sit on the throne of God effectively that's who the, the two lords are the Lord that's God said to my Lord that's Christ sit on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool so the ascension and exaltation of Messiah that's written in the Psalms too now this would be quite staggering for many of the Jews I'm sure they'd think wow never thought about that never seen that before you can understand how you know how the apostles through the holy spirit were starting to open up the scriptures to these men it'd be like a light you know a light bulb moment we call it don't we where it ping it suddenly goes on and they begin to see it but he didn't say he would stay at the right hand of the father look at the end of verse 34 lord said to my lord sit thou on my right hand until wasn't there to stay until I make thy foes thy footstool again we'll come back to that in a minute therefore he says let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you crucify notice the, the deliberate emphasis yes that man not some other person not some other being not some other Messiah that might come along that man the one Jesus the one who you crucified he is Lord and Christ notice that he's Lord and Christ Lord that's that's a term of great elevation and authority almost almost to the to the level of God himself of course God has put all power and authority in the hands of Christ he is Lord and Christ um, and now he's at God's uh, right hand and verse 36 notice he says he says whom ye have crucified <laughs> I should think that made them feel very very uncomfortable many of these men and women who are listening to this must have been present when the terrible deed six weeks before at Passover had happened the dreadful trial the business with Pilate the mob shouting crucify him where were these people when that was happening I'll bet some of them knew all about this maybe they'd shrunk into corners maybe maybe some of these people were actually people that Jesus had healed where were they when he was being harangued and abused and falsely accused where were they well you can imagine that when they hear this now they feel very guilty indeed and that's exactly that's exactly what God wanted it's exactly what the apostles wanted not that they enjoyed seeing men wriggle if you like in their guilt but nevertheless it was necessary and it is necessary isn't it when people come to God we need to feel sorry for what we've done this is repentance it's a lovely phrase in verse 37 it says when they heard this they were pricked in their hearts pricked in their hearts and that's got to happen this is why there was such a massive massive um, 
response to this first preaching by the apostles of the gospel. Because on an enormous scale, people were suddenly realizing what they'd done. Suddenly realizing that it was all of God. And that it was all written in their own Old Testament, which they'd read. And they didn't realize what they were doing. In fact, in chapter 3, Peter says, look, I know you did it in ignorance, as did your rulers. Well, I think he's being quite nice to the rulers there, but that's what he said to try to sort of soften it a bit. But we see the lovely impact this would have. In fact, to come over to chapter 3, we're just going to look at a couple of verses there. Look at verse 13. Uh, chapter 3 verse 13 he brings the, the the fathers into it the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob the God of our fathers hath glorified his son Jesus whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go look how he, he, he lays it on thick even Pilate could see that the man had done nothing worthy of death, but you were determined to have him dead. And you killed the prince of life, verse 15. And notice in verse 14, he calls him again the holy one and the just. Imagine how they would have felt the holy one and the just uh, and demanded a murderer to be granted unto you now in verse 13 this is important very easy to to, to um, gloss over it he specifically calls him there the son of god in verse 13 now uh, you may or not have noticed but in fact in the preaching of the apostles it doesn't actually say jesus the son of god very often i suggest to you that's because that would be quite a hard thing for the jew to begin with and I think gradually no doubt in their preaching and their instruction this would come but here he is quite clearly verse 13 it's the it's uh, God hath glorified his son Jesus whom you delivered up um, so that's that's now the fathers are brought in here the promises so that's part of his preaching of the gospel also look at verse 25 um, ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying to Abraham in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed now the Jews would know that that's one of the promises to Abraham that in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed and it's actually repeated it comes at the beginning of Abraham's life and at the end as well in thy seed here is the seed Jesus is the seed and he explains it in verse 26 unto you first God having, set, having raised up his son Jesus sent him notice to bless you this is the one through whom the blessing of Abraham Mr. Abraham would come in turning away every one of you from his iniquity so again he's, he's saying not only is he the one prophesied by David, the son of David who would reign on his throne, he's also the seed of Abraham who would be the blessing on all nations. So we have the promises to David and in fact to Abraham also here. Notice also in verse 14, Jesus is the just one as well as the holy one. Again, the sinlessness. They would understand what was meant by that verse 18 of chapter 3 those things which God hath showed before by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer he hath fulfilled again repeating this is all God's plan it's all in your Old Testament it's in your scriptures you Jews you just haven't read it you just haven't thought about it enough now of course this He's only been to David and the Psalms. We would probably go to Isaiah, wouldn't we? Where there's, there's whole rafts of stuff about the sufferings of Messiah. Perhaps he did. Perhaps we just don't have it here in Acts 2 and 3. Well, back in... Um, no, not back just yet, sorry. Verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Now, this is important teaching, isn't it? Men have to believe and men have to be baptized. But here he says, 
men also got to repent repent and be converted that's being born again if you like using Jesus' language there's got to be a change a change of mind a change of heart a change of life and then he says that your sins may be blotted out. I wonder if they realize that that's also a quotation from the Psalms. Blotting out of sins. When times of refreshing shall come. So we've got conversion and repentance and belief and baptism. Now it's chapter 3 in particular which goes on. If you look at verse 19 again. When times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. So Jesus is coming back. That's the other big teaching here. He's not gone to heaven to stay there. Peter says he's coming back. Heaven must receive until, well, he doesn't say until the kingdom of God, does he? He says until the times of restitution of all things. What's the restitution of all things? Well, a Gentile wouldn't understand that, but a Jew would. A Jew knew everything about the restoration of all things. What did he look for? He looked for the restoration of Israel. The restoration of the throne of David and of the kingdom of God as it used to be in Israel. That's what he was looking for. And in fact, if you keep your finger there, just come back to chapter 1 and verse 6. That's exactly what they asked Jesus about. Uh, verse 6, when they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's what they wanted. That's what the Jews wanted. And Jesus had to say, well, hang on a minute. Just slow down a bit. He says, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. He didn't say to them, no, you've got it wrong. What he said to them was, it's not yet. Now, we know it wasn't yet. It's been 2,000 years, and it isn't yet, but it is surely close. But nevertheless, the teaching quite clearly is there that Jesus will return from heaven to establish, to restore all things, what we would call the kingdom of God on the earth and they of course wanted to be part of that in fact that's what it says Luke chapter 1 isn't it that he shall reign over the throne uh, he shall sit on the throne of his father David and of his kingdom there should be no end whole thing therefore rooted very much in the Old Testament well I haven't actually added up there or tabulated perhaps I should have done uh, all the doctrines that are covered there in Acts chapters 2 and 3 and this is what Peter preached but it's pretty much it's most of the things which we believe which is a wonderful testimony I think for us really that the, 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 the most of the Christadelphian doctrine from scripture is there in Acts 2 and 3 and I think that's you know that, that, that's nice now this became part of the apostles doctrine um, Acts chapter 2 how does it finish it's a lovely end isn't it the end of Acts chapter 2 verse 41 then they that gladly received the word were baptised when it's confirmation Jesus said go and teach men and baptise them and they were baptised the same day were added to them about 3,000 souls difficult for us to imagine that I mean the logistics of that are a bit of a nightmare aren't they you know what do you do with 3,000 new converts where do you meet how do you organize them how do you teach them but they did that's what it says in verse 42 look they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and we've just been looking at the apostles doctrine and all that that encompassed and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers so it's a lovely confirmation then of the things we believe. And yes, they did do what Jesus says. They did go into all the world and preach the gospel, not to begin with to every creature, but eventually. And we should be very thankful for that, because that's why we're here this afternoon. Right, I'll leave it there. Thank you.